what did we do in abstract algebra for this semester? Abstract algebra overview. Well, the really big picture overview is we did groups, rings, and fields. That's sort of thought of as being the main topics of a typical undergraduate abstract algebra class. There are other abstract algebra topics, by the way, beyond groups and rings and fields. I mean, one of them is vector spaces, but there are all sorts of other strange things. Monoids, get a couple of monoids if you want. Division al algebras, okay, I, I'm just mentioning a couple names. You could look into them if you wanted to. These are sort of the core of the subject, starting with groups. What's the key thing with groups? Remember, math doesn't just come out of nowhere. It doesn't appear out of nowhere in people's minds in a vacuum, so to speak. People historically think about examples first. And they only come up with the abstract math when they see commonalities between examples. The way math is presented in textbooks is the opposite of the way it's discovered, you might say, in real life. People think about examples first. They think about, oh, you know, the integers, the rational numbers, the real numbers. We can add integers and get another integer. We can add rational numbers and get another rational number. We can add two real numbers and get another real number. Complex numbers. Of course, we can also do multiplication, and people knew that, but for the purposes of unifying simpler ideas under the, the idea of having just one operation, it's best initially to focus on addition. If for no other reason that addition's simpler, for example, every element having an additive inverse, whereas not every element has a multiplicative inverse. Even in these fields, Q, R, and C, zero does not have a multiplicative inverse. In the integers, only plus or minus one have multiplicative inverses themselves. Two, yes, has a multiplicative inverse, one half, but it's not an integer. So it's better initially to focus on just one operation. But then people notice that, hey, you know, there are other kinds of structures. And in fact, this name of this course used to be different. It used to be called algebraic structures. There are other kinds of algebraic structures that have an operation that satisfies similar properties. Zn as a set consisting of those and numbers under addition mod n is closed when we mod by n associative for addition, identity is zero, it's got additive inverses. For example, the additive inverse of one would be n minus one, right? If, if I asked you in the abstract, what's the additive inverse of one in here? It would be n minus one. Why? Because one plus n minus one is n is zero mod n. What would the additive inverse of two be? It would be n minus two. <clears throat> Right? For particular examples, we can think about that perhaps a little bit more easily, but you could even think about it in the abstract. It also happens to be commutative, <clears throat> excuse me, as all these were. Are there any non commutative groups? We later attach the name abelian or non abelian to these things. Uh, people notice hey, there are certain sets of functions that are closed under function composition. There's dn, the dihedral group of order 2n, right? This has got order 2n. dn itself, if you wanted to write it in the abstract, would include n rotations, which if we're writing the rotation amount in degrees, in the abstract, we could write that as r0, r, uh, for example, if, D, if n were four, the minimal 
rotation would be a 90 degree rotation, 360 divided by four. In general, you divide 360 by N. Then multiply that by two, two times 360 over N, et cetera. The last one would be R sub N minus one times 360 over N, talking about the degree of the rotation. And then you'd have N flips as well, N reflections, F1, F2 through Fn about various axes of symmetry. I'm not going to try to even draw a diagram, but you know, here's how you could represent Dn in the abstract. Not specifying how to make the full Cayley table. That would take a lot of work. <clears throat> but it's got order 2n. You've got uh, Sn, we saw. Symmetric group on n objects. All the permutations of n objects. So the elements are permutations. The operation is function composition. Do you remember how many elements this had? What's its order? N factorial, yeah. For example, S3 has three factorial elements, six elements. What are they? There's the identity epsilon, which you could also write like that. I'll use cycle notation. You've got two cycles, one, two, one, three, and two, three. Right, that's up to four elements. Remember the cycle representation is not unique. One, two is the same as two, one. One, three would be the same as three, one. Two, three would be the same as three, two. Then you've got three cycles. This one and this one, and there are no others though there are other ways of writing these. One, two, three could be written as two, three, one, or three, one, two. One, three, two could be written as three, two, one, or two, one, three. And you also can write these as products of two cycles with a little trick. Um, this trick here in both two cycles, start with a one, put the last number in the three cycle in the first two cycle, put the second to last in the next one, et cetera, if you had a longer cycle. This does work. One does get mapped to two. Work from right to left here. This maps one to two, two gets mapped to itself. So ultimately one gets mapped to two. Here, this maps two to one, but then one gets mapped to three. So ultimately two does get mapped to three. And this maps three to itself, but then three gets mapped to one, just like it does there. And this one is one, two, one, three. And those are different. If the cycles are not disjoint and these are not disjoint, there's a common one in them. They do not necessarily commute. Only disjoint cycles commute. An has n factorial over two elements. That's the set of all even permutations of n objects. What's an even permutation? It's one where the cycle, the elements, the permutations can be written as an even number of two cycles, a product of an even number of two cycles, like these two. Yes, they are three cycles, but they're technically even permutations because they can be written as an even number of two cycles. These three are not even permutations, even though they are two cycles and two is even. Because we're writing them as one two cycle, not an even number. The identity permutation <clears throat> is even. You can, for example, write it like that. It can be written as an even number of two cycles. So for example, A3 consists of the identity permutation and then these two three cycles, which are even permutations. Two, uh, three factorial over two is three elements. It is a subgroup. An is a subgroup of Sn. And in fact, An is a normal subgroup of Sn as well. In fact, here's a more general fact that's worth knowing. 
if H is a subgroup of G with index two, then H is actually a normal subgroup of G. That's a, that's a general fact worth knowing. I haven't really emphasized it in class. I think I did emphasize it in the lectures. In writing all this, I'm focusing on examples. I've ignored a lot of stuff in the first six, five chapters or so, including in talking about normal subgroups here. I guess I'm in index, I'm talking about chapters seven and eight, seven and nine as well. What other kinds of things did we discuss that was important in group theory? We mostly focused on finite group theory. So yes, while these are groups, they were not main, our main examples that we focused on. We focused on finite examples mostly because that's sort of, for beginners, the more interesting thing to focus on. And you might say the simpler thing to focus on. Infinite groups are harder to understand in the abstract. And you've got things like, you think about the order of a group as being the number of elements in the group. You got the order of an element, A. If it's N, that means N is the smallest positive power where this is true. It doesn't mean if this is true that the order is N. N has got to be the smallest positive power of A, bringing you back to the identity for the order of A to be N. These are not equivalent to each other. That's the smallest positive power where this equation is true. And we did lots of examples, just to try to understand these concepts where you were, you know, computing groups, computing Cayley tables to help you compute orders of elements to understand these definitions. And we all had the idea of what is a subgroup. Real quickly, a subgroup is a subset, first of all, that is itself a group under the exact same operation. And so that would also mean that even though, say, for example, Z4 is a subset of Z8 in terms of its elements, 0 through 3 is a subset of the bigger set, 0 through 7. It's not a subgroup. But Z4 is not a subgroup of Z8 because the operation is different. That's a fundamental thing to know, to realize. There, the operations addition mod four, there it's addition mod eight. It's a different operation. Therefore, they're completely different groups, even though they are related as being one being a subset of the other. Similar kind of thing happens with the U groups. One could be a subset of the other, but the operation is different. So it's not a subgroup relation. On the other hand, if you make an appropriate identification, an appropriate isomorphism. S3, for example, could be thought of as a subgroup of S4 under an appropriate identification of, if you got a permutation that permutes three elements and you're wondering, can I think about it as being a permutation that permutes four elements? Yes, just keep that fourth element fixed. And that's kind of implicit in cycle notation. When I write, a cycle like this, I'm sort of implicitly saying it's an element of S3. But there's nothing stopping me from thinking of it as an element of S4. So in a sense, you could think of S3 as being a subgroup of S4, as long as you make the right identification of realizing, okay, we're taking num the number four and fixing it. Likewise, Dn, for example, could be a subgroup of D2n because the, uh, the, it's not only a subset, but the operation is still the same. It's still function composition. So whether something's a subgroup or not, it's a little bit more subtle than maybe we typically think about. But we also did have this, the subgroup test. Subgroup test, that was very important. We use that a lot. Not because it's the most important thing in group theory, but because it just makes for nice exercises. Getting practice in, in doing basic kinds of exercises in group theory. So it's, it's nice for homework problems and it's nice for exam problems. 
there were, there were three subgroup tests really. We mostly used the first one step subgroup test and the two sub, sub subgroup tests. There was also a finite subgroup test. In all cases, you had to first verify that H, the proposed subgroup was non-empty. That was kind of the, the zero step. For the one step subgroup test, you were given one step, you were given A and B in H and you wanna show A, B inverse is also in H. For the two step, you're given A and B and H and you wanna show two things. Show that A times B is an H and A inverse is an H or B inverse is an H. Why bother with the two-step when you can do the one-step? Because sometimes the two-step just feels a little easier. Feels a little easier to think about being closed under multiplication and closed under inverses individually, one step at a time, you might say, rather than sort of doing them both at once. For the finite subgroup test, if G is finite and you're trying to show a subset H, a non-empty subset H is a subgroup, it's good enough to actually just verify closure, turns out, under multiplication. But we wanted to get practice with these, so we mostly use these. Cyclic groups are really important, right? We always were talking about cyclic groups. By definition, that's this. That's a cyclic subgroup generated by an element. It's, it itself is always a cyclic group. A every group has plenty of cyclic subgroups. That doesn't mean the overall bigger group is cyclic though, because it doesn't mean any of those cyclic subgroups equal the entire group. When they do, that's nice, we're happy. When, when it's not, then that makes things harder. G is cyclic if and only if G equals a cyclic subgroup generated by some element A for some A, not necessarily all A in the, in the group, but for some A in the group. Then we got into later chapters in the group theory, chapters six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 11, that dealt with more abstract ideas isomorphisms initially, but then we also had automorphisms and ultimately homomorphisms. And the author does emphasize, Galleon emphasizes that though these are similar ideas, their roles in group theory are different. The role of the idea of an isomorphism not only being operation preserving, but also one-to-one -one and onto, is to identify when two groups are the same or not. Are they the same up to isomorphism or not? If you can find an isomorphism from one to the other, then they are. If you can't, they are. and if you can prove you can't, then they're not. And there are various properties of isomorphisms that more easily allow you to say when two groups are not isomorphic, Simplest one is that they have a different number of elements. They have a different number of elements. You can't even come up with a one-to-one -one and onto function between them, whether it's operation preserving or not is irrelevant. If they do happen to have the same number of elements, the next thing to do probably is to focus on what are the orders of the elements. If they don't all match up, if they don't have this, for example, the same number of elements of order four, then they will not be isomorphic because isomorphisms preserve all group theoretical properties between the groups. Automorphisms are isomorphisms from a group to itself. And for us, that provided a way to construct new groups that might tell us something about the old group. And inner automorphisms played a role later in also thinking about classification of groups those kinds of ideas in chapter 9, for example, and 10. 
later on homomorphisms, chapter 10, there you only want operation preserving. You're not necessarily one-to-one -one or onto. And the author emphasizes that the role of homomorphisms is really more to take a group and find another group that's simpler than the original, that is a homomorphic image. Got the domain group over here. You map it homomorphically onto perhaps some smaller group that's simpler. Probably it's it's on to, but not one to one. Being operation preserving though is enough to preserve some of the properties of the original group, but the the new group, the smaller group, the simpler group is easier to understand. Is sort of the big picture idea of homomorphisms. In between there, we had other stuff. We got Lagrange's theorem, of course. the most important theorem in finite group theory. Quickly remind you what it says. You got a finite group G and a subgroup of G, H. The order of H has to divide the order of G. The number of left cosets of H and G is the order of G divided by the order of H. H the order of H divides the order of G, so you can actually do that fraction. And it's an integer. And then there are various corollaries, including the orbit stabilizer theorem. And we also considered examples of um, external direct products. And all of this stuff, its purpose was to lead to classification. Classification facts. For example, any group of order of prime order is cyclic. If you got a group G of order P where P is prime, it's isomorphic to ZP in fact. That's one classification fact. Another classification fact just off the top of my head is any group of order P squared where P is prime must be abelian. In fact, if G has order P squared, it's isomorphic to either a cyclic group of order P squared or external direct product of ZP with itself. There's a classification fact for or groups of order 2P. They are either cyclic of order 2P or isomorphic to DP, at least when P is bigger than two, DP being the dihedral group of order 2P. Not cyclic, not even abelian. And ultimately, in chapter 11, there's the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups that really completely classifies finite abelian groups. And that was our main purpose with group theory, right? Classification. Kind of an abstract goal. We're trying to play the role of group theorists and understand groups. Classifying groups is how you understand them. Because you're completely studying them, you completely understand certain groups. Just like a, a botanist would completely understand, well, as much as possible, certain animals. Then after that, it was rings and fields. Fields are rings. So really, when I say rings and fields, I'm really mostly just talking rings. More broadly, fields is a specialized subject within rings. But it's interesting enough in its own right to say that when we're studying fields, we're, we're doing field theory. But ring theory includes field theory. Rings and fields. Now we're allowing two operations, two binary operations, an addition and a multiplication. Are they always addition and multiplication? Actually, they're not always addition and multiplication. There are some rings where the ring operations are not literal addition and not literal multiplication, uh, we never really studied any of those, but they do exist. Though sometimes you think about rings of matrices, and we certainly plenty of times thought about rings of polynomials. That was our main emphasis, in fact. That's our main goal with ring and field theory is understanding polynomials, their factorizations, their roots, as much as we can. 
but we did it start abstract. A ring is always a group, an abelian group, in fact, under addition, if you ignore the multiplication. But then there is a multiplication, which minimally satisfies closure. It's a binary operation. Associativity. And distributive property, a new property, over addition. Though, because you're not assuming that the multiplication is commutative, you do need to write down two distributive properties, essentially. A left distributive property and a right distributive property. Those are two separate properties in the abstract. If your ring does happen to be commutative, then they're the same property, really. And yes, commutative means commutative with respect to multiplication. And when we say commutative, we don't say abelian. Different historical developments. Historically, that's what happened. Ring theorists and group theorists, they didn't even talk to each other really, really that much, is my impression. So when group theorists were talking about abelian groups, ring theorists are like, huh, what's that? Okay, I, I might be exaggerating, but that's sort of the picture. We use the word commutative for multiplication. Rings don't have to have a, a one. They don't have to have a unity, though they often do. 2z, for example, all the integers, the, the even integers, is a ring. It's closed under addition and multiplication, and it satisfies all the ring properties. It's got an additive identity, zero, but it doesn't have a multiplicative identity. There's no one. Although we saw rings can be weird, that doesn't have a unity, but this set does have a unity. This has a unity, unity under multiplication, not mod four, not mod five, but mod six. So you can think of it as a subring of Z6, and it is a subring of Z6, and it turns out to have a unity, and the unity is um, four, not anything else. It's not zero, it's not two, and there's, there's no one in there, but four acts like the one, amazingly. It's weird, but true. If you think about Z6 containing 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 under addition and multiplication mod 6, that's a ring where the unity is 1 and not 4. 4 acts as the identity with these numbers, but not with, uh, for example, 4 times 1 is not 1. 4 times 3 is not 3. 4 times 3 mod 6 is, in fact, 0 which brings up another weird thing that can happen, zero divisors. Those things happen in the abstract, but we kind of like avoiding those things when we get down to it. So then we start talking about integral domains. No zero divisors, commutative rings with unity when there's no zero divisors. Fields commutative ring with unity in which every non-zero element has a multi multi multiplicative inverse, meaning it's a unit. And then we started getting into stuff with ideals being the analog of normal subgroups, factor rings instead of factor groups. Sometimes those factor rings were fields when the ideal was a maximal ideal, for example. Well, that's when it would be a, a field. We were interested in those ones that were fields because we were interested in maximal ideals because we were interested in irreducible polynomials. Principal ideals generated by irreducible polynomials were maximal. So we were always thinking about, okay, is, let's, let's create a field, for example, of some finite order. Let's find a polynomial that's irreducible over the field, create the principal ideal generated by that and consider the corresponding factoring. And we know it's a field. We did that a lot. So that very fast, yeah. But you did that a lot. And there were irreducibility tests in chapter 17. Then since the last exam, we talked about vector spaces field extensions, splitting fields, examples, various kinds of theorems related to these, how to write this field extension like we just even talked about today. 
finite fields and ultimately Galois theory. Okay, you can go into much more depth on any of these topics, group theory, ring theory, field theory individually, and there are other topics that we didn't get to. It's an active field of study. Plenty of people still do new things in group theory that nobody's ever done before, day by day. Okay, that, that's happening now in pretty much every area of math, including abstract algebra. 